a lot of people tend to look away or probably keep themselves busy so that they don't ask them when they ask about CT scans. This is a topic that's a really great area for so many students and I thought, why not teach about CT scans? So grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is usually on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to start a series of quite interesting topics. We're going to be looking at CT imaging. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend, drop a comment, drop a like, and let's go. Here's our warm-up question. A 40-year-old was involved in an RTA and presented with reduced level of consciousness along with projectile vomiting. A CT scan was done and shown in the image. Question A. What does the CT scan show? What is your diagnosis? Why does the patient have projectile vomiting? You may pause the video at this moment. Write down your answers. I will give you the answer at the end of this very short lecture. This will just be an introductory lecture towards CT scan, so it won't be as in detailed. And so don't expect to learn how to read CT scans or read chest CT scans or CT scans of the head at the end of this lecture because it's a series of lectures. But by the end of the series of lectures, you should be confident in reading and having the basics of how to interpret certain CT scans just in case where you do not have any a radio, radiologist or technician to actually help you interpret the CT scan. So this basic information is very, very vital. For those of you that have never seen a CT scan before, this is what the, actually the machine looks like. So the patient actually sleeps on this bed. Then of course, this of course is going to be moving into the CT scan machine. So this is the CT scan machine and this is the whole setup if you have never seen a CT scan before. So just a little bit about the physics and the terminology. I know most of you are going to find this as a shock, but CT scans are actually x-rays. I know it's, it's it's really, really shocking to some of you. So this is just an imaging technique where you have a cross-sectional image that's obtained using x-rays. Yes, the same x-rays that you take and send patients for to get an x-ray. But then you ask me, if a CT scan is actually an x-ray, then why is the quality of a CT scan much better than the x-ray? Very good question. So number one, what you really need to understand is that as the patient is passing through the CT scan, the rotating gantry, they are going to be actually releasing these, um, the, the, there's an x-ray tube that's going to be releasing x-rays. And then on the other side, you have detectors which are going to be reading this information. So the information that's coming from these detectors is going to be sent to the computers and then once it's sent to the computer then this is going to be analyzed by the computer and then it's going to be converted into a grayscale image so the fact that you have this computer analysis actually gives you a greater depth of an array and many different types of densities that you can use so it's not just with the x with the x-rays where you just have about five densities the gray uh, you have the white the dark and of course the light gray and the, the off-white and the the like super super bone white you have a bit of a, a much wider range of i could say quote unquote colors in terms of the ct because now the computer can analyze this so because you are receiving so much information from these detectors and it's being analyzed by the computer you find out that you're displaying this cross section where you can actually differentiate the normal anatomy from the pathologies and also this actually increases the sensitivity when you actually give specific um, drugs or specific substances like contrast and so you can actually detect certain things like the presence of fat you can detect certain things like the presence of calcium on the ct scan so remember that just like with the x-rays if you have an object that is quite dense an object that is huge or rather i can say quote unquote thick for example, like bone, it means it's going to block a lot of x-rays from going through. So it means that it's going to have a high uh, attenuation. So it means that it's going to appear white or light gray on the CT scan. So it's referred to as high attenuation. If you have one that allows a lot of x-rays to pass through, it's going to be appearing dark gray or black in color. So this is known as low attenuation. 
So remember that bone is going to give you a high attenuation on the CT scan, while it's the lungs may show you a low attenuation on the CT scan. Now, by altering this gray scale settings, you can actually manipulate this image to actually display you different types of tissues in the body. I'll give you a very good example. Suppose you're getting a CT scan of the chest. So the, remember that the chest has a wide range of tissues and a wide range of things that are going to be present. You have the lung, in the lung you have blood vessels, you have lymphatic vessels, you have lymph nodes, you have of course the alveoli itself, which is part of the parenchyma of the lungs. And of course you also have the heart and the structures that make up the heart. So actually, if you set the setting of the computer to show you the lung window, then you actually are going to be able to see the lung parenchyma in greater details. But if you set it to the mediastinal window, you won't be able to see any details in the lungs. What do I mean? So here's a perfect example. So this is the same patient, the exact same patient. But the only difference that we have done is that in this first image, this is known as a mediastinal window. So when you see, sometimes you may be asked this on your exams, they flash you this and they ask you which window is this? So this is obviously a mediastinal window. The reason why it's a mediastinal window is number one, you can't really visualize the lung details. It's just dark. It's not showing you any details in the lungs. But of course, you can see the right atrium. You can see the right ventricle. You can see the aortic valve. You can see the left atrium. And of course, you can see the aorta. These are the vertebra over there. This is the sternum. Of course, these are your ribs over there. So this is what's known as a mediastinal window. Now, this one on the other hand here, this is what's known as a lung window. Notice how you can still see the structures that we were seeing in the mediastinum there, but we can now even see the details of the lung parenchyma over there. You can see the lung anatomy. So if you want to see pathologies of the lung, you should ask for a lung window, or you should actually view it using a lung window, because if you use a mediastinal window in the chest, you won't be able to pick up these lung pathologies. So another thing that we talked about is attenuation, where it's just simply a measure of the relative density of an area of interest. And we can actually measure this electronically. And the unit that we use to measure attenuation is known as Hounsfield units or HU, Hounsfield unit. It's actually named after the person that invented CT scans by the name of Godfrey Hounsfield. So remember that water has a CT attenuation of zero Hounsfield. And other substances are going to be compared in relation to water. So it means if it's less dense than water, for example, fat and air, it's going to have a negative value. If it's much more greater than air, it's going to have a positive value. So some of the common attenuation values include water, which is zero Hansfield units. The muscle, which is 40, means it's much more dense than water. Contrast enhanced artery is 130. Cortical bone is 500. The fat is minus 120 air is minus 1000 Hansfield units. So here's an example of how this can be applied. So here you have, of course, a mediastinal window, okay? And you have this mass here, which is showing negative 81 Hansfield unit. So remember, whenever you have a negative value, it's much less dense than than water. So it means it's either air or fat. In this case, it's most likely that this is um, fat. So this is most likely a benign pulmonary hematoma. And you know that benign pulmonary hematomas do not need any further treatment, no further follow-up. So this is how these Hansfield units can actually be used to determine what type of pathology you actually have on your CT scan. So you also have contrast, which can actually be given to the patient intravenously or it can be given orally, and it can actually make certain pathologies stand out more than the others. We'll talk about this a lot more in details when you look at different specific pathologies, when you look at the CT scans of the head, when you look at CT scans of the chest, as well as of the abdomen. But here are some of the indications for you to get actually contrasted CT studies. So you may have IV contrast where the contrast is administered intravenously. This can actually be done to differentiate between normal vessels and abnormal masses. For example, a hyla vessel versus a lymph node. I think I'll show you a picture of this in the next slide. It can also be used to make a differentiation between uh, the abnormality and the normal lung parenchyma. So meaning that 
or the normal parenchyma rather, meaning that you can actually have this liver metastasis stand out more from the normal liver parenchyma. It can actually also be demonstrating vascular nature of a mass and also can aid, can actually aid rather in characterization of the mass. Then it's also important in CT and geography. Then you may actually have oral contrast, which is given orally and the patient actually swallows. This is very important, especially for the CT abdomen. This can actually help you differentiate between the normal enhanced bowel loops as well as abnormal masses or fluid collections. I'll also show you a picture of this very shortly. It can be used in the diagnosis of perforation of the GIT but of course in our setting here we most likely depend on the x-rays. You just get a, an erect chest x-ray if you see air under the diaphragm specifically it's more common on the left side then most likely you actually right side not the left side right side because on the um, left side you may actually it may actually be in the stomach but it's usually on the right side you also see a double diaphragm sign on the erect chest x-ray then of course the diagnosis of a surgical anastomosis leak and of course ct enterography so you actually have to remember that a detailed examination of the pelvis as well as a distal large bowel can actually be done by rectal administration of the contrast as opposed to the oral administration so here is an iv contrast scan of course as you can see here you have a node that is being shown here so you can see this node here and you can see that there's this left pulmonary artery over there so you have this lymph node and the left pulmonary artery because of the enhancing of the contrast we can be able to differentiate the node from the left pulmonary artery of course you also have other structures here like the descending iota the ascending iota over there the superior vena cava and of course the main pulmonary artery then on the other aspect here, this is an oral contrast, which is obviously showing an abscess. This is the abscess here that does not really, it's not really enhancing with contrast as opposed to the small bowel and the large bowel over there. So this is an abscess. Of course, how do I know that it's an abscess? So of course, it will be married with the clinical picture. If this person is presenting with features like an abscess and you get a CT scan and you get such a presentation, then it will more, li more, li more or less actually correlate with your clinical judgment. Then there is something that's known as a multi-detector row CT, which is also known as a multi-slice CT. This is actually much more advanced. So in the early 90s, this actually was developed. It's also known as a spiral CT scan or a helical CT scan. Now, what's the difference? I'll, I'll come to this image before we come back to the slide. So this is the initial model of a CT scan. So the patient goes through the CT scan. On one side, you have the X-ray beam. On the other side, you have a single detector. This is the basic CT imaging, this basic CT scans that were created. Now, you, we modified it in the early 90s and we actually came up with a multi-slice CT scan, whereby you have the X-ray tube, but on the other side, you have multiple scanners, multiple detectors that can actually create this helical pattern or kind of like a circular configuration and more of a, a more accurate, more 3D like representation of whatever is being scanned. So these ones are going to differ from the conventional scanners in that the tube and the detectors are going to be also rotating at the same time. So it's like they're moving constantly as the X-ray beams are being shot. It, the, the detectors are also moving around in a helical manner or in a spiral manner. So the circular gantry of the X-ray uh, actually has an X-ray tube on one side and the detectors on the other side that are continuously rotating, giving this helical pattern. That's why it's referred to as a spiral CT scan. Then, of course, these ones are going to be having different rows of detectors. Initially, the original multi-slice CT scans had about two or four rows of detectors. Then later on, it was advanced to 16, then 64. Then now we even have 256 and 320 rows of multi-detectors. So the higher the number of rows, the more details the image is. So you can actually have a multi-detector giving you a very accurate and a very uh, highly detailed 3D image. And this can be essential in many, many different areas of medicine. So what are some of the uses of a multi-detector CT scan? You can use it in CT angiography for the coronary, cerebral, carotid, pulmonary, renal, visceral, and peripheral blood vessels, cardiac CT, including CT coronary angiography, coronary artery calcium scoring, you can have CT cholography, which is a virtual colonoscopy, CT cholangiography, which is to do with the 
biliary tract. Then you can also do a CT enterography and you can also use it in planning of very complex repairs. For example, if you are planning to repair the acetabulum, the foot and the ankle, the distal radius, and even the carpus. This can actually also display complex anatomy for planning of cranial and facial reconstructive surgeries. So here's an image of a three-dimensional CT that was taken with a multi-slice. So as you can see, this is an infant skull that was reconstructed. There are different parts that are labeled here. So the FB here stands for the frontal bones. The PB here stands for the parietal bones. Then of course, this CS, this is the coronal suture. This is a metoptic suture. Then you have the anterior fontanelle here, which is the AF, and then this is the sagittal suture. Notice how the sagittal suture here has fused at the posterior aspect. So remember that the normal sutures on the 3D CTs are going to be appearing as lucent lines, darker lines, and um, they're going to be in between the skull bones. But here in the sagittal place, it has fused, so premature fusion of the sagittal suture. So what are some of the limitations of the CT scan as we end this lecture? So number one is ionization radiation. They are x-rays, so they provide you with a lot of ionizing radiation. So there are some hazards of use of contrast material. Some people can have this contrast anaphylactoid reactions. They may have a contrast-induced nephropathy. So there are many different things. So we have to actually get a prerequisite. The, you have to make sure that before you actually take the patient for contrast imaging, their creatinine is within normal range. Otherwise, if it's slightly elevated, you may pre-rehydrate pre the patient before taking them for the contrast imaging. Then it's like, it's not really portable. You can't really move the CT machine. It's very huge. Then it's also quite costly. In our setting, I think the CT scan Plain CT scan should be well above 900 kwacha. This is at the time of recording of this video. It must even be much higher than it is right now. Then just before leaving, I just want to mention about two things, the Alara principle as well as CT scans in pregnancy. So remember that the basic rule of radiation is to protect all patients at all costs. So you should provide them with justifiable radiation exposure. So it should be kept low and as reasonable as possible. How do we do this? So each radiation exposure should be justified case by case. We don't just order CT scans just because the patient needs a CT scan. There should be a quite soluble, solid reason. Then if, for example, you can do other investigations like ultrasound that are non-radiating investigations, let them do them. If they can do the MRI, let them do them. So if ultrasound and MRI can be done, it should be done wherever possible. And of course, the mobile equipment is only used when the patient is unable to come to the radiology department. This doesn't apply to a CT scan because it's not so mobile. It applies to the x-ray. So you can, should only use the mobile equipment when the patient cannot come to the x-ray department. Then, of course, the minimum number of radiographs should be taken and minimum fluoroscopic screening time should be used to limit the exposure to the radiation. Then children are actually much more sensitive to adults and actually have a greater risk of developing these radiation-induced cancers. So there should be some protection that is offered to children. There should be extra measures such as protection of the gonads by using gonad shields and of course adjustment of the CT scanning parameters. Then when it comes to pregnancy, remember that you should take extra caution whenever ordering imaging in pregnancy. So extra measures should be taken, especially for women of reproductive age. So radiation exposure to the abdomen and to the pelvis should be minimal. All females of reproductive age must ensure they are not pregnant before getting the radiation exposure. So make sure you get a pregnancy test. And of course, the multilingual signs uh, posted in the medical imaging department asking the patient to notify the radiographer if they are possibly pregnant should be present in your department. And remember that organogenesis is unlikely to occur in an embryo in the first four weeks following the last menstrual period. So it's actually not considered as a critical period for radiation exposure, contrary to what actually people believe. So organogenesis is actually going to be starting soon after the time of the first uh, missed period and it continues for the next three or four months. So during this time, actually, the fetus is considered as maximally radiosensitive. So at all costs, avoid any radiographs. Then, of course, a radiographer or the CT scan examiner of the abdomen or the pelvis should actually be, uh, delay this if uh, possible at a time where the fetal sensitivity is reduced. For example, uh, after 24 weeks of gestation or ideally until when the baby is born. 
then wherever possible, use an MRI or use a C use an ultrasound. Avoid the CT scans. And of course, radiographic exposure to remote areas such as the chest, the skull, the limbs should be taken when there is minimal ex fetal exposure at any time during the pregnancy. And then for those that are actually going into nuclear medicine studies in the post partum period those that are breastfeeding it should be advised that they should stop breastfeeding and the breast milk that is removed from the breast for the following two days must be discarded after an injection of radionucleotide material coming back to our warm-up question a 40 year old was involved in a road traffic accident and presented with reduced level of consciousness along with projectile vomiting a ct scan was done and shown in the image what does the ct show so this is of course the left sided so on the ct scan this is the left side this is the right side okay so this is the left sided convex high attenuating lesion or it's you can call this as a convex hyperdensity so as you can see here on the same side you have com compression of the ventricle so ipsilateral compression of the ventricle and shift of the midlines to the opposite side so shift of the midlines to the contralateral side. So this is most likely consistent with acute hemorrhage. Remember that acute blood is going to be appearing hyperdense on the CT scan. We'll talk about more of this when we look at CT scans of the head. So this is most likely an acute epidural or extradural hematoma. And the patient is most likely going to be having projectile vomiting due to increase in intracranial pressure. I really hope you enjoyed this episode on introduction to CT imaging. If you want more of such videos, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.